is Nathan Barrett, Barnett, sorry, for the CEO of Swarmify, who's going to talk about why your video streaming fails and why your customers hate you because of it. So, Nathan? Thank you. Um, th thank you. Thank you. Um, we haven't even gotten through it yet. Don't clap yet. Could be horrible. So uh, first we have to figure out how do you know if a customer hates you? What is, what is hate? Um, and so what, what uh, we took a look at was a recent study that Ericsson just did where they measured stress um, to, to sort of uh, correlate that into uh, hatred or their sort of feeling towards your brand when different things happen. So how do you make someone stressed out so you can get a baseline? Well, apparently you hook them up to a machine like that to measure their brain waves, and then you make them do very complex mathematics. Um, that's how you get your baseline. And so what does that stress look like? Well, it kind of looks like this. Um, so that's your baseline. That's where you're figuring out if, if you hit anywhere near that, your customers are upset. This is a bad emotion that you don't really want to evoke unless that's sort of your intention. Um, but we're not measuring uh, you know, content, just the delivery itself and, and how it's presented. So let's compare. Hook the same person up to the same machine. We show them the buffering spinner. What does everyone think that looks like? Mm -hmm. Kind of like this. Um, similar, uh, uh, I'll get to the actual numbers behind it in a minute because uh, you know, the picture is just sort of to illustrate. But it's actually just as stressful as having them do complex mathematics. So when this occurs and your customer sees that spin wheel, buffer symbol, whatever you want to call it, you're basically being now associated with a complex math test, which unless you know, the customer likes math is, is really not what you want for your brand. Um, and so a more simplistic measure is, uh, which is very subjective, is how do you get a measurement of emotion from someone with no emotional filter? We show Dora to a two-year-old, and you make a buffer in the middle, and they have no filter. And this is at my actual daughter when this occurred. They look like this. Uh, no machine needed. This is what occurs. I'm sure anyone who's, uh, Netflix is great. Uh, streaming is great for kids, but when it breaks, it's a meltdown and they don't understand why. And we didn't actually understand why uh, until we looked into it. So what is causing buffering on the internet? Um, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what does buffering cause in terms of the numbers? I apologize. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so Ericsson saw that it doubles your stress level, which is uh, similar to the math test. It was essentially the same as taking the math test. From a, from a, uh, a non-math test or just your normal stress, it doubles it. Limelight found that 51% uh, of people, when they hit the buffering after the beginning of a video, they will bail. You will lose half of your audience as soon as they see buffering. Conviva found that your average user engagement on a monthly basis actually decreases 14 minutes if that user ever experiences buffering during that month. So if you're based on subscriptions or churn, that's important because usually the more that someone's watching your content, the more likely they are not to cancel your subscription. Akamai found that uh, there's actually a 5% uh, ad revenue loss, and that's 5% for every 1% of your users that experience buffering. So it's actually Tremendously higher than 5%, but it's based on your buffering rate, which we're going to get to. Uh, what percentage of your users experience buffering? Uh, you lose substantial ad revenue. And what we found was that when there's a buffering event, people watch 64% less video. Um, we're in a society where there are services delivering video consistently, and people's attention spans are getting shorter. They will switch um, unless you really have some sort of captivating content that they're willing to fight the buffering experience, they'll try something else. Uh, I've seen this where I sit down, uh, the kid's going to sleep, which is great, that's like parent time, uh, turn on some uh, a streaming service and it fails in the middle, well, I switch streaming service, my time is limited, I can't sit and, and mess around and hope this gets better, because in a lot of cases, once it starts buffering, it just keeps happening on that same service. But yet you can switch elsewhere and it'll work fine. I'm sure other people have seen this. So great, buffering's bad. Who knows the rebuffer rate in this room? Just one person? Man, where are you, do you mind saying where you're from? What? I'm from Germany with uh, Maxdom, video on demand service. Okay, okay, so it's very important to you? A couple more, okay, a couple more, great, great. Um, the sad fact is a lot of people don't even know what their rebuffering rate is. They have metrics like time to first bite, and, and those things are all very important, right? You want the video to start up quickly. But no one's paying attention to what happens when the video fails in the middle. We know it's bad, everybody talks about it, 
we uh, do different compression, different bit rates, whatever you can to get around this, but a lot of people aren't measuring it. Um, I can tell you one thing, you can bet Netflix is measuring this. Uh, uh, I visited with them and uh, they care a lot about this stuff and so everyone else should. Because if you're not competing with them at their level um, as much as you can, that's gonna be bad for you because my fallback is always I go to Netflix. Someone else's service fails, I go to Netflix. Even if the content isn't what I wanted to watch, I'll find something. Um, and so people don't know their buffer rates. So let's talk about what the buffer rates actually are industry-wide from a variety of measurements. Uh, since people don't know their buffer rate, let's look at what the people in the industry are saying who do measure it. Conviva uh, has a report and 28% of video views have rebuffering, which is buffering not at the beginning of the video. This is at some point after the beginning. The beginning is kind of a gimme. 60% have quality service issues, which means that there probably was going to be a buffering problem, but it switched to a lower bit rate to help resolve that, which uh, is better than a buffering, maybe, although there's data that shows that if you switch the bit rate too low, it's actually a worse solution than the problem itself. People would rather watch it buffer than have it switch to a low bit rate, which is blocky and, and bad looking. So you're not actually fixing the problem if you put a super low bit rate. You're actually making it worse because now you're giving a customer an experience that they're associating with your brand, which is blurry video sometimes, um, and no one wants that. So let's see what our data said. In the month of April, we measured 122 million video sessions, so uh, it should be a fair enough amount of data. We saw 18% uh, rebuffer rate on people uh, delivering video. Um, so maybe it's improved, maybe we're measuring more generously than Conviva. Um, we're not really sure, but 18% is close to one in five. Um, neither of those numbers are good whether it's 28 or 18, almost doesn't matter. I think a lot of people who aren't measuring assume we're down in like the single digits. We're not in the single digits. Um, if you ask people, hey, what video site is bad for you? Everybody will name a site. They'll say, oh, Facebook video's bad for me. Or they'll say, oh, where I'm at, YouTube's bad. The thing is, everybody knows a site where they're at that the video streaming's bad. And that means someone knows your site has video streaming that's bad in their area. It's very location, time of day, um, sort of dependent. It's very unpredictable where video is going to fail on what service. If you can switch to another service and see video working properly, then you're probably experiencing this issue. Great. So here we go. Why does it fail? Could be network congestion. Um, could be server meltdown. Uh, could be you weren't paying for the fast lane. Um, but really, who do we blame? It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Your end user doesn't know about anybody's brand except for yours. They don't know about whether you had congestion because you were paying this service or that service or the other service. They don't care. That's not a, a, a thing that your end user is actually paying attention to. They just know video on your service was bad. So how do we solve this? It's actually a totally different approach. You have to look at video playback and say, how do we make it resilient? How do we uh, make it able to withstand and recover from difficult conditions? Because that's essentially what's happening on the internet all of the time. So our solution was to make video playback resilient to failure. We actually put a brain in the video player. Let the video player make decisions. Let it do things to help solve these video issues for you so that your end users aren't suffering from them. And that way, too, the brand gets to help control the experience. They get to help see. Um, you know, what are my problems? How do I solve this? Let me be proactive. Let me not just point the finger. Because like I said, the user doesn't see that finger point. They just see you. So let's take a look on those 122 million video sessions we measured. Um, people who were not using our solution, it was a multi-CDN. So if you're going multi-CDN, uh, maybe that's how we got to 18% with them. I'm not sure. Uh, adaptive rate playback. So this is even with lower bit rates, 18%. Great. Where can we get to? Our customers, less than 3%. Fail-proof video delivery. Uh, basically, by putting this brain in there, we, uh, we do some really smart things on the delivery side. We manage the relationships. And that brain is able to make decisions intelligently for each individual user and help solve those problems. Because those problems are varied. And it's very hard to pinpoint what is the exact problem. It's not always a bitrate issue. It could be the server meltdown. It could be you know, a whole myriad of issues. and by putting logic there in the video player and making it more aggressive about figuring out how to solve those problems, we can do a lot better, and we're doing a lot better. So here's a demo. What does this look like in practice? Well, it looks kind of like this. Which video do you want to watch? Um, what you'll see is uh, ours loads faster. Um, the one on the right, buffering again. 
and the one on the left, the, the playback's over on this, um, you know, plays much, much more smoothly. This is the end result, and this is what anyone who's offering a video on demand service cares about. All of the other pieces don't really matter. It's getting your content to your end users, making them happy, and making them love your service. And when they do that, and your service is reliable and others aren't, that alone is a competitive advantage. If you uh, think back to the earlier number, about 51% of people bail when they see a rebuffer, and if you have an 18% rate, that means every month you're losing 9% of users because of rebuffers, right? 18 divided in half, 9%. That's what you're fighting against. You have to grow past 9% just due to technical issues if you're at an 18% rebuffer rate. Um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a steep battle. And, uh, you know, I don't know why more people aren't talking about this issue. I know we all hate the rebuffering, but um, anyways, we're offering a solution. If someone wants to talk to, to me about it, I can go in more detail about how all the pieces we are that we're solving it. But I just wanted to kind of present the data, get people thinking about other approaches to this, to solving this buffering issue than, um, than what's being put out there, because we're not doing a great job. I mean, multi-bit rate, multi-CDN, 18%. Not a great number. Thanks. Questions? All right, he's got to get that microphone. Yep. Excuse me. Thanks. Thanks, Art. Um, Nathan, what's required for your uh, solution? What's the integration requirements for your solution? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So uh, actually right now, so our solution is targeted strictly for video on demand. So I'll put that out there. Uh, that tends to be a, the majority of the actual uh, content consumed. I know live it also has different issues and there are people helping work on that as well. Um, so the integration um, is basically just some JavaScript you install. There's a lot of magic behind the scenes. It's more complex that we're handling, but our integration is just some JavaScript you put on the site. We manage the rest. We do some things. Um, you know, anyone who wanted to integrate, we can discuss all the other pieces of what we're actually doing um, in that process. So your model is browser-based video, HTML5? Currently, it, yeah, currently it's browser-based, um, and it's, uh, yeah, HTML5 browsers, yeah. Okay, but you could probably do something at the app level also? Correct, yeah. Okay. We just, right now we're, we started first in the browser, and, um, and we're, migra you know, we're uh, have the uh, mobile application toolkit on our roadmap. To Great, purpose. thank you. Other questions? Hi, Nathan. Uh, is the solution tied to a certain CDN? No. Or? So actually, one of the great things is that uh, right now, a lot of people are trying to manage the multi-CDN themselves. You don't have to deal with that anymore. Basically, our, our model is based on transfer and storage, like a CDN. We manage all those multiple relationships underneath. It uh, actually, it usually ends up saving you money or it's about the same as what you're paying for a CDN. Um, and that's it, we don't charge extra fees. We've got our margin underneath all of that. So uh, we manage all those things. We actually take some of that complexity away. And over time, if there's a new CDN that pops up, does a better job or this one does a worse job, uh, basically we're making it our responsibility to integrate those people, migrate the content as needed from our side and not make that the video on demand providers problem um, to, to really make it so that you're always getting the best video delivery. We want to be judged on uh, the pricing and the video delivery, which I, we feel is how you should be judging the service providers, not all of the other things that end up getting mixed up in that. So ju just to clarify, we're talking about HTML5 players only? HTML5 in the browser, no player support? Uh, no, we, no we, we integrate with all of the uh, major video players, but it, it only kicks in on some of the uh, on HTML5 browsers. So if you're not using an HTML5 browser, it'll actually just keep delivering the way that you're doing it now. It falls back seamlessly. And um, did, did I just hear you say that you then act as the CDN and you're partnering with multiple CDNs, so we have a single relationship as the provider with you and then Swarmify would handle any other relationship with the CDN? Yes. One billing, one contact. Absolutely. One neck to choke when things go bad. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, honestly, that's what's required to make this all work because the thing is with the CDNs, um, even them, you know, they're, they're constantly shifting and who's got the right technology and who's overloaded because, you know, this one's doing Olympics and this one, you know, is less busy at this time. Uh, that shouldn't be your problem if you're a video provider. You know, if, if your business is content and delivering that content to end users and you're used to the TV model, right? I mean, you, you put it through the cable system and they make it show up at the box. 
And that's what everybody wants. So judge us that way. We'll make it show up at the box better than others. You said this is video on demand only. Do you have um, any plans to support live? Uh, so uh, we do have plans. Uh, the, the only hesitation is that I would say that's further out into the future. And the reason is, is that they're completely different animals and that approaching the solution exactly in the same way um, is not really the right way to do it. Um, and so we don't want to do live till we can offer the same you know, incredible improvement we can do on on demand. And that's going to take time and effort. So we're focusing right now on, on rolling out the video on demand and then you know, we'll, we'll talk about live later. Any other questions? All right, thanks again, Nathan. Thank you.